Hello, dear friends, and welcome. I'm so glad that you are here today listening to this video. And uh, just in case you are listening to this premiere on Sunday morning, uh, go ahead and say hi in the live chat. We'd love to connect with you there. Or uh, if you're watching sometime later during the week, as uh, I think at least 50%, if not more of us, catch this video later in the week, feel free to leave a comment below the video. We've turned on comments for our services now, so uh, you can chat in there as well as you're watching, if you would like to. And uh, since I'm on the, the trajectory, the, the topic, that's the word, of communication, um, you can sign up for our emails if you would like to be on our email list. You can go to bluewaterchurch.ca and at the bottom of each page, just click that button that says join email list and then you'll be in the loop for all of the great things that um, are coming up, whether that's upcoming guest speakers, um, teaching series here online, or news about drop-in and uh, moorings, other things, uh, including things Things like Dinner Church. Uh, Dinner Church is what our monthly in-person gatherings are becoming as of this month of June. On June 26th, we're having our first Dinner Church. And in talking about Dinner Church with our committee who's helping to plan this, uh, this new initiative, this new way of being a church together, we decided to call it something other than Dinner Church. I mean, Dinner Church is great, it's simple, it's uh, straightforward, it's uh, exactly what it sounds, except that a lot of us hear the phrase Dinner Church and we automatically think it's a, a church dinner. And what we're gonna be doing is actually a little bit different. Actually, it's a lot different from a regular church dinner. And we're gonna spend the next three Sundays after this one uh, actually delving more into the theology of dinner church, um, of table church, as it's sometimes called. Anyway, in the meantime, let me share with you what we're going to be calling our dinner church. We're calling it Supper and Stories supper and stories. Hopefully that catches on. We're going to be sharing um, some little cards, invitation cards that we're going to have printed out that we can give to people as invitations. We're going, you're going to be seeing um, supper and stories on our website and uh, on various places, social media, email, things like that. And the idea is very much as it sounds that we're going to be gathering together at the bridge uh, around tables, sharing a meal together. There will be supper provided. That's where we're gonna have conversation, connection, um, connect with old friends and make new friends. And then after supper, there's gonna be an option for people to go home or go, uh, you know, take their kids to soccer practice or whatever it is that that person or that family wants to do that evening, free to go or stay for another 15, 20 minutes for a Jesus story, a story from the life of Jesus straight from the Gospels and, uh, and maybe a time of prayer as well. And so that's gonna be the structure of most of our uh, supper and stories, our dinner churches going forward. And so I'm really excited, really looking forward to it. Um, we've purchased a few new tables to add to the bridge so we have enough space to sit 40 people. 40 is about the number that we can comfortably seat uh, at the bridge. That is at 746 Queen Street, downtown King Carden. And so we are asking that people will just notify us if you're coming to save your spot just in case we end up having 500 people who want to come the people who have signed up ahead are going to be guaranteed a spot i don't know yet how many people will be there so that space really might not be an issue however we are asking that you head to bluewaterchurch.ca there is a sign up um, form just for your name or your family's name and how many people are coming plus a contact phone number. That would be very helpful. Again, just to guarantee that there is a spot saved for you if you know that you can attend. There will also be a physical sign-up sheet at 
the bridge so that people during drop-in can just sign up right there on the spot. Uh, no need to go to the website. Um, to do that. But if you're watching this video, then probably it won't be too great a challenge to just head to bluewaterchurch.ca and head to the supper and stories section of the website. And just let us know that you want to save a spot for you, for you and your spouse, your kids, uh, a friend maybe. Um, again, it's not like a, a ticket where you have to prove that you registered to come in. It's just save your spot. And so anyway, we are going to be hearing more, learning more about dinner church. And I, as I've been learning about dinner church from some of the experts who have been uh, experimenting with dinner church and exploring dinner church theology um, through the scriptures and particularly in the life of Jesus in the early church. And so we're going to discover a little bit of that together here in these online videos um, for the next few weeks. And I've made the mistake of calling dinner church a church model, a model of doing church. When in fact, I've been, I've been told that dinner church is actually a theology. It's a theology of dinner church. It's a way that um, is really rooted in the life of Jesus and in the practices of the early church. So I hope that that's intriguing to you. I hope that you can come in person and hey, if you want to make a a uh, road trip, a day trip to King Carden or spend the weekend here. King Carden is a lovely place to be in the summer. And we would love to welcome you. So our supper and stories are those evenings are going to be every fourth Sunday of the month. So um, again, for June, that's going to be June 26th. And for every fourth Sunday, it's going to be from 530 till seven o'clock come at 5 30 there will be a clear sign on the table that says you know it, I'm not sure exactly what time it will be but it will say this is when the Jesus story will be so for those people who uh, are new to church aren't sure about church um, there's no pressure to stay for that part it's just a welcome invitation so I'm really excited about this and um, probably you can tell because I've already been rambling and I said to myself this intro is going to be a tight two minutes so that's out the window. Anyway, I'm also really pleased to uh, introduce or reintroduce to you our guest speaker for today. His name is Dale Tollefson. We heard from Dale last Sunday. And in particular last Sunday, he was sharing about the, the way that reconciliation is at the center of our work as followers of Christ. And today he's going to be sharing how community is the center of our lives. And uh, it's worth sticking around for. It's worth hearing all the way through. I think his actual message is exactly 26 minutes long and it is well worth the 26 minutes. So um, Dale is also going to reintroduce himself, uh, do a little summary for any of us who happen to have missed last week's video, although you can head to our YouTube channel and catch any video that you've missed or might want to revisit. So with all this in mind, I'm gonna slow my talking, slow my breathing. I, joy, I invite you to join me in just taking a deep breath, maybe take a sip of the tea or the coffee that I'm pretty sure you have near to you as you're watching this today and uh, let's just join in prayer dear lord jesus thank you so much for each person who is tuning in to this message would you uh, speak to each one each one individually and to all of us um, even as a community even uh, whether we are local community here through Blue Water Church in King Carden or connected in heart and spirit and uh, through Wi-Fi signals. Um, God, I just thank you so much for each one. And thank you for Dale who is sharing with us today. Um, we just ask that anything you want to speak to us, uh, the truth that you have uh, to share with us through Dale this morning, that uh, it would just sink in deep and that it would resonate with us. God, we want to be um, a people who 
learn what it is to walk in obedience in our daily lives, to, to follow you, Jesus, um, to count the cost and to say, yes, I, I'm all in. I want to follow you and uh, whatever that looks like, even if sometimes it seems counterintuitive or like we're, we're used to pursuing a certain definition of success and we just invite you to, um, to redirect us however you want to. We want to be a church where people flourish, where, um, where each person who connects to Blue Water senses your love, senses your presence, and um, that this would be, be a space where people are given uh, the opportunity to partner with your spirit. Do you work in each one to bring about healing and transformation? Um, we pray this for, for people in Blue Water Church. We pray this for, for staff. We pray this for uh, Laura Ross, who cleans at the bridge and does such a wonderful job for for Jackson Brotherton who edits these wonderful videos for for Nathan and Johnny for Marilyn for all the mooring leaders uh, Lord just make this a place of peace of safety of flourishing for each one and uh, help us to know what that looks like together to be able to um, commit to the flourishing of one another, of each other, as we practice what it means to live with community at the center of our lives. And we just thank you for, for who you are, for this opportunity to sit in your presence, to know that we're connected to one another, um, to sit with anticipation for when we will see one another at uh, supper and stories, or perhaps even before then. So we give you this time and our attention. Amen. So now there is a worship song that Nathan has prepared, and we're going to open with that to bring us into a posture of worship, to bring us into uh, just an awareness of the goodness of God, of the holiness and the presence of God from wherever you're watching today. So I invite you to sing along if you'd like to, or just let the words wash over you as you listen. And then Dale is gonna come on screen and he's gonna close the end of the service. So after Dale says adios or whatever he says in, in goodbye, uh, that's gonna be it for this Sunday. And I hope to see you again around here sometime next Sunday. Hi friends, thank you for connecting with us again this week and uh, welcome to our home. Uh, if you were with us uh, last week, uh, you might remember that my name is Dale Tollefson and um, we, Kathy and I, lead a BIC community of faith here in Stouffville and we love Stouffville and we love our community, lo love our church community and, and love our, our Stouffville community. Uh, last week, I told you a little bit about our story, um, our church story. And so just quick recap, we, uh, our church began to meet in 1809. So our church community is 213 years old. And uh, recently, we made the very bold decision uh, to sell our church property and to plant a new expression of a community of faith here in downtown Stouffville. And that, that's quite a bold step for a 213-year-old church to do. And in short, we are moving from rows to circles. We're, we're changing completely our entire uh, ministry model and, and moving from rows to circles. And I'll talk to you about that uh, in just a moment. Uh, last week, I mentioned that there's a book that has been very significant for us and actually a book that's been very significant for me to learn the BIC values. So I've only been in BIC for three and a half years and there is so much that I love about BIC. I just affirm so many of the values that it's built on, that, that our community is built on. And this book, 
what is an Anabaptist Christian, for me, really summarized and crystallized some of the things that I love about BIC. Uh, first of all, the, the one chapter of the book um, talks about uh, Jesus. I need to get the wording correct here. Jesus is the center of our faith. And I love that about BIC, that, you know, that uh, in, a, in a practical way, we really ask the question, you know, what would Jesus do? And we build our, we, we, yeah, we, we build everything around Jesus, which obviously is a good thing. But then last week we talked about uh, the second, or no, sorry, the third chapter, reconciliation is the center of our work. And do you remember last week we talked about how there are two parts to reconciliation. There's spiritual reconciliation, reconciling us human beings to God. Uh, but then there's social reconciliation, re uh, reconciling human beings to each other. And that's the social justice aspect of, of what we do. And we need both of those elements. It's like two wings of an airplane. We need the spiritual reconciling man to God, but we also need the social justice aspect. And, and without the two wings, you know, the plane won't fly. So today, I'd like to go back and talk about the second chapter of this book, which says that community is the center of our life. Community is the center of our life. Um, as we are moving forward here in Stouffville with our community of faith, this idea of relationships is super, super important for us. It's, it's, it's really central. The idea of relationships and giving people a place of belonging. And I really liked what the author of the book, What is an Anabaptist Christian, said when he reflected, I think it was a, a man, when he reflected on, um, on how Jesus, uh, you know, initiated this model of, uh, of relationships and, and community. And if you have the book and you want to follow along, uh, on page 9, paragraph 3, the author said that by referring to his followers in family terms, family terms, it became evident that Jesus wanted his followers not only to believe in him, but also to have a strong sense of belonging to each other. It's not just, not just head knowledge, not just kind of believing, but belonging. And that's really what we're striving for, uh, a sense of belonging to each other. Observers uh, back in Bible days were amazed at what God did in and through these er groups of early Christians. They had the gifts, insights, and courage to continue doing what Jesus had begun to do while he was with them. Now listen to this. If you would have asked those first followers of Jesus, I believe they would have said that Christ-centered community is the center of our life. Christ-centered community is the center of our life. And friends, we need to understand that when the, when the, the first uh, the, when the early church, when the first followers of Jesus had Christ-centered community and belonging at the center of their life, they were only following the example that Jesus uh, gave them. They were only following the model that Jesus created for them. Think about this, that um, in New Testament days, when Jesus came along, he didn't sit the disciples in, in a row or sit them down and he didn't just lecture them about this is what you should do and this is what you should think. There was a teaching, lecturing involved, but Jesus um, invited the disciples to live with him. And so they traveled together, like they walked long distances together and uh, they ate together, they laughed together, they did everything, they, they lived together. And, and that was the model of the rabbi in the early, in, in New Testament days. That's how, that's how rabbis taught their students. The students didn't go to a, like a University of Toronto kind of thing, they, they hung out with the rabbi and they learned from the rabbi. And so from the very, very beginning, the whole rabbinical model was not just about a lecture, it was about living with and getting to know the rabbi, right? And so that's what Jesus did. And, uh, and Jesus, Jesus um, 
had relationships at the core, loving relationships at the core of his um, ministry model, right? In fact, this is really shown very clearly in Matthew 22, where, where somebody comes along and, and they say in verse 36, teacher, which is, the most command, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And here's how Jesus replied. You must, first of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then Jesus quickly goes on to say, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Friends, I, I'm going to move over this thought fairly quickly, but I want to just really register this with you, that relationships and community is absolutely at the center of how Jesus did business. It was absolutely at the center of his discipleship model, and it was absolutely at the center of how the New Testament church moved forward because the New Testament church um, it w was built on, on community and built around meals, right? And, and meeting in people's homes. And so I'm, I'm going to move fairly quickly over that thought, but I, I really just want to register that with you, that relationships are super, super important. And we're building our whole model around this idea of community and relationships and giving people a place of belonging. But taking that a step further, this idea of relationships, um, our new model is built around food. It's built around a meal, built around a table. And so if you were to join us on a Sunday morning, um, when you first arrive, you know, you don't come, there are no rows, uh, there's just a big table. You first arrive, we come and we hang out, we grab something to eat, we sit around the table, we laugh, we talk about our week. We just there's, there's no like official start time of our gathering. We just come and hang out and have fun together, right? Just, just getting to know each other and, and yeah, just, just spending time around the table. And then, uh, and then we'll transition to a little bit of very casual worship, just James and his guitar. And then I'll talk for just a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes or so uh, to summarize um, our weekly teaching. And then we have a long conversation about the thoughts that that um, about you know the the topic of the week, and um, and I am amazed at what uh, what's happening around the table. Uh, I'm amazed at what happens in the the early stages before we do anything formal. What happens around the table? The the, the, the place of belonging that we're able to offer people. And I'm amazed at what happens in the conversation around the table, right? And so here's a, a very, very significant question that we had to work through in our community here in Stouffville uh, as we were moving towards a new model and as we were moving towards uh, a model built around a table. Here, here's the question, why? Why? Why are we building our model around the dinner table, or in our case, the brunch table? And, and the answer is maybe uh, in two parts. First of all, we are inviting people to the table. We're, we're, it's like picture a family table, uh, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. Think, think of a big family table when the whole family is around together, right? We are inviting people into that space. We're inviting people around our family table. And, and um, part of that is inviting spiritually curious people to the table and inviting them into relationship. You see, quite often people who are not part of a church currently, if you ask them to come to, you know, sit, come to our church gathering and sit in rows and in a traditional model, they're not really too interested in that. But I have found over and over again in my conversations with, with people who are not part of a church, they are interested in coming and um, sitting around a table, enjoying relationships, and they are interested in a conversation about Jesus and not just being lectured about Jesus. And so we're inviting spiritually curious people to the table, to, um, to a safe space to learn and to talk about Jesus. 
But there's also very much an aspect of that we're inviting people to around the table to a place of belonging. We're inviting them to, to just be part of our community, regardless of, of where you are in your spiritual journey, regardless of you know, how much Bible you know. Or We're just inviting people to a place of belonging. And friends, can I tell you, that especially in Stouffville here, and, and there's a pretty good chance that in Concordia it's very similar. But I'll, I'll tell you that, um, that loneliness and isolation is a really significant problem in our community. Loneliness and isolation. And people just, just um, eat it up when you give them a place uh, to belong a safe place to belong where they can meet friends, maybe new friends or friends that they've, you know, known for a little while or whatever, but they just soak up that having a place to belong and a place to be loved. It, we, we've said recently that um, just like Jesus, you know, with Jesus, we are fully known and fully loved, right? There, Jesus fully knows us. There's nothing he doesn't know about us and he fully loves us, right? And so we are inviting people to the table where they can be fully known, where they can um, come with all of their weaknesses and all of their baggage and all of their crazy ideas. They can come and they can express that stuff and, and, and they don't have to hide it. They can just be themselves. They're fully known and will love you just the way you are. I think that that kind of a belonging and loving community is very, very attractive, especially to people who, who are not currently part of a community of faith. So here's the question. Why are, why are we here in Stouffville uh, moving to a model that's built around a table? The first answer is that we are inviting people to the table. We're inviting spiritually curious and others to the table to just find a place of belonging where they can be fully known and fully loved. But the second answer, and, and maybe the more significant answer, is that we believe that we are returning to a biblical model. We, by, by meeting around tables, we're actually much closer to the model that Jesus initiated and the model that followed through in the New Testament church. We're much closer to that model than we are sitting in rows uh, uh, on a Sunday morning. Um, the, the, the Bible is full of examples of people eating together and uh, just doing life together. Let's go all the way back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was a thing called a covenant meal. And this was an actual thing. If, you, if you're taking notes, jot this down, Genesis 3154. Genesis 3154 and Exodus 24, 10 and 11 that if two people entered an agreement, uh, for example, to buy land, they didn't sign a legal document, they didn't have lawyers draft up a contract or whatever. If pe two people entered an agreement, they did it by eating a meal together. And so this idea of eating a meal together goes way, way back. And even this idea of, of a reconciliation, so, th so there was the covenant meal that we just talked about, uh, but there's also a reconciliation meal, and it's called the Sula meal, where enemies ate a meal together to work out their differences and, and to, rec to reconcile their differences, right? So two people, and, and think about this in, in like modern terms. Two people have an issue, they have a misunderstanding, and they come together and they eat together. There's something really significant when we eat with people, that somehow barriers come down and somehow relationships are formed when we eat together, right? And so in, in the case of the reconciliation meal, two people who have a misunderstanding or some kind of a problem, they come together, they talk about their differences and they reconcile their differences. And, and in the Bible is called a reconciliation meal. In fact, it could very well be what David was referring to in Psalm 23, five where David said, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. And, and then lastly, the, the Old Testament is full of mosaic laws or feasts 
um, you know, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles. These were parties. These were feasts where people came together to celebrate God and to celebrate, you know, what God did, has done in their lives, right? So the Old Testament is full of people eating meals together and celebrating together. And then we move ahead to the New Testament uh, day. And, you know, and Jesus comes along and Jesus steps into this culture where eating together around a table, around a meal, it was very significant. And Jesus carried that forward. In fact, we see so often in the life of Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't come as a religious figure that was like, you know, kind of with a halo, you know, uh, over his head. And like, I'm, I'm, you know, this great religious figure and you should come and worship me. No, Jesus came and he hung out with people, right? He hung out at parties. He walked with people. He hung out in the town square. Jesus just spent a lot of time hanging out with people. And he spent a lot of time eating at people's houses. In fact, um, I love this quote from Robert Karras. Uh, he says that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. Check that out. Read, read through Luke's gospel. Here's some homework for you. And make note of the number of times that it's referred to that Jesus you know, was, coming from, was at a meal or, or coming from a meal. And in fact, all through the, new, uh, the gospels, this would hold true. And, and, and so much so, that Jesus' critics, the only thing, or one of the things that they, they could say about him was that he was a glutton and a drunkard. Look in, in Luke chapter 7, 34. Jesus is referring to himself here when he says, the Son of Man feasts and drinks, and, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. I, I love that. I love that. Jesus spent so much time hanging out with sinners, tax collectors. Uh, he spent so much time hanging out with them that the only thing that his critics could say that he was a glutton and, and a drunkard. And this story or this, um, this idea carries forward a little later in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, where it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was, listen, he was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree, a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going uh, to pass that way. Now listen in verse 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name, Zacchaeus. He said, come down, quick, come down. Listen, I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I'll give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Listen, for the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Came to seek and to save those who are lost. Uh, so just, you know, you, you know, I'm sure that tax collectors was, uh, were like thieves and traitors to Israel. These were like really, really unpopular people. And Jesus called him out. Uh, I don't know if he knew Zacchaeus from just being around, but Jesus called him out by name, you know, Zacchaeus. And, and listen to what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, Zacchaeus, I want you to come to the synagogue and I want you to listen to me teach this afternoon. No, so the equivalent of being, hey Zacchaeus, I want you to come to our Sunday gathering and listen to the pastor preach. No, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I wanna to come to your house. 
I want to hang out with you. I want to eat food together with you. You see again how this is deeply built into the model of how Jesus did uh, ministry. And of course, we know that Jesus uh, that, uh, that when Jesus, you know, came, that, that the grumbling of the people, again, it's similar to uh, Luke um, 7, um, that, you know, people grumbled that Jesus was a, a glutton and a drunkard, and Jesus, uh, people grumbled again, um, verse 7, but people were displeased, he has gone to, to be the uh, guest of a notorious sinner, and I love this last line, um, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Friends, the real answer to this question, why are we in Stouffville moving towards a model that's built around a meal? Why are we moving to a model that's built around belonging and relationship? The real answer uh, and the simple answer is that we believe we're following the mission of Jesus. We believe we're following the mission of Jesus and the example here of Jesus and Zacchaeus of, of um, reaching people who are far from God. And this line, for the Son of Man has, uh, came to seek and to save those who are lost. And so, yes, we're inviting people to the table we're inviting people to a place of belonging and uh, a place where spiritually curious people can, can, uh, can investigate, can ask questions in a safe environment. And, and, um, and we're also you know, following a biblical model, and, and I believe a more biblical model than what we have in our modern churches today. But we're doing this because we hear the call of Jesus to follow the mission of Jesus. This is not our mission, this is not our idea. This is the mission of Jesus to reach people who are far from him and following the model of Jesus to do it around food. And uh, so, yeah, so that's what we're doing. And uh, I understand that, that, that you're um, uh, moving towards, you know, a model with dinner church and, and uh, a model that's built around food. And I applaud you for that. I applaud you for taking the bold step of, um, of doing something new and doing something that sometimes is uncomfortable because stepping towards new and stepping towards the unknown is always uncomfortable. And I applaud you for that. And I applaud you for... Uh, following, you know, what you believe is the mission of Jesus and what Jesus is calling you to, okay? So I trust that this has been helpful, learning a little bit about our story and what we've learned along the way. Let me finish by praying for you. Lord Jesus, um, we, we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to follow you and your model and follow you and your mission and help us to do that i pray lord i pray for for the spiritually curious people who are within our spheres of influence maybe personal relationships maybe friends or family members or maybe uh, outer circles of people that we know but god we pray for those who are spiritually curious and i pray lord that you would help us as we invest in those relationships. Help us, God, to, to make a difference in their lives. Help us to share a little bit of what you've done in our lives with them. And in, um, in relationship, help us to point them to you, Jesus. And so, Lord, uh, again, I thank you for my friends in Concord, and I thank you for what you're doing in their lives and in their community. And I do pray that as they take steps towards following you, I do pray that you'll give them great success, give them insight, give them courage, and uh, Lord, help them as they move forward, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, thanks again for, uh, for connecting with me, and thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Your mercy never stops. Your mercy.